Hi folks, today's episode on the microcontroller series is on fundamental electronic skills, tools, techniques, somehow related to microcontrollers. I'm not going to get into the more um, advanced stuff like oscilloscopes, logic analyzers and that sort of stuff. We'll see about those uh, by the time we need them. And I'm not going to talk about fundamental electronic lab equipment sort of things. Um, if you want something like that, Dave Jones, EV blog, episode 168, and yes, I wrote that down, um, and I'll link it in at the forum at www.sapletter-it.com slash bivblog slash 43. He's done a um, very nice introduction what you need for a general purpose electronics lab. Well worth watching if you are unfamiliar with this stuff. Generally speaking, just one thing you want to keep in mind when you watch it, some of the stuff he shows there you don't need for microcontrollers. And what's even worse, he starts with some of the basic things and then uh, goes on with, and yes, you eventually collect this and that and whatever. And he keeps summing up uh, towards a grand total that's, I think, about $2,000. And um, that might be a bit discouraging. However, afterwards, he explains, yeah, no, we all started with a, a shoddy multimeter and a dicky soldering iron, and that's really the point. A lot of the stuff he mentions there, yes, you will accumulate over time, but that doesn't mean you have to rush out buying all of these right away. Starting with microcontrollers or electronics in general, you don't really need that much, and... Uh, just buy things as you need them. Um, if you're not sure what you need, maybe buy cheap. Figure out what you need. Yes, buy cheap, buy twice, I know. But that basically means the second time you actually buy something, you know what you need. And more often than not, the cheap stuff might actually still work for you in the long run. I mean, for example, no, this is not a fluke precision time measurement tool, despite the colors. This is a stopwatch I bought more than 10 years ago from a toy store of all places. And if they sold this at an electronic store, Fluke would have sued the hell out of them because they were using Fluke colors. Works fine, even with the original battery. No reason to buy anything more expensive that, like that than that. So buying cheap might actually be quite sensible. Beyond that, first thing to talk about is, uh, of course, workplace safety. Uh, in his video, he mentions a fire extinguisher. He doesn't even bother to mention first aid kit, uh, an assortment of uh, sticky plasters or uh, adhesive bandages, Americans call them. Um, you just want to have those around. So much about common sense. If you hadn't realized that so far, maybe you should try uh, to find a less dangerous hobby, profession, whatever. Um, you just want to have these around. I mean, obvious, right? He also mentions uh, safety glasses. And yes, you want these. And despite me wearing regular glasses, I use these mostly because I'm short-sighted. So when I do soldering, I take the regular glasses off. Um, what he doesn't mention uh, dust mask doesn't work too well with the microphone, but when you grind down uh, some strip board perf board, board size with the Dremel, you want to use these. Don't need them too often, but when you do, you do. And uh, finally, a pair of gloves for the occasional rough work, whether it might be metal splinters or whatever. Don't need them too often, but eventually they refine themselves because you'll save on the plasters. Other than that, if you're sort of incapacitated uh, under the influence uh, of alcohol or other narcotic drugs, basically, as a rule of thumb, if you're unfit to drive a car, you should stay away, at least from the more dangerous tools and uh, mains voltage. You should stay away from mains voltage anyway, but um, just use your brains for Pete's sakes. Um, 
that said, if you think it's choice either going on a jaw ride or playing with electronics while you're not exactly fit, stick with electronics. At least chances are you're just going to hurt yourself, not anybody else. Okay, so much about work safety. Couple tools you will find useful Bremel. Bringing a bit of perfboard, stripboard to size. Yes, you can use just a hand file uh, or a belt sender or whatever. But um, I found a cheap ass Dremel clone really, really useful. It doesn't have to be anything expensive, just buy some cheapy and uh, use it until it falls apart. And then maybe decide, yeah, it might be a Dremel or Proxon or whatever instead. Second, hot air gun, heat shrink. Tremendously useful. You'll use it in all sorts for all sorts of things. Uh, the only reason I mention it here, despite it being pretty much standard electronics, is uh, because what you might not notice, if you really get into electronics and don't have a hot air gun, it might actually make sense to buy a hot air desoldering thing tool for some like I think I've seen for it, but about 80 euros. Um, and use that for the heat shrink stuff rather than a general purpose hot air gun, which is basically meant to strip paint, which you wouldn't, wouldn't want to do with a desoldering tool or hot air desoldering soldering, uh, tool. Um, might actually save you money. Third, uh, there is hot snot gun, hot glue gun. Everybody calls them hot snot, I think. Um, aside from the usual general purpose you just stick things together and make things look really like a prototype which can be quite useful keeping uh, sales people from rushing off to a customer here we've got a working product um, Hotsnot has two really nice properties and those are it's kind of elastic so it works doubles triples as some kind of strain relief and it's electrically insulating and Take a look at this. I told you it's looking ugly, but the difference between a long lasting solution to connect ribbon cable to breadboard and something that's just going to give you pain for a couple of days and then you throw it away is having hot snot in here. Makes this thing much more long lasting. Make sure there are no, there are no shorts between the pins and it just works. And no, it's not going to ruin your beauty contest. But that's not exactly the point. Okay, next topic. Computer. Now, for general purpose electronics, you might get away with a tablet or even an ebook reader to read documentation. But when it comes to microcontrollers and programming microcontrollers, you do need a computer. And I've said that before. Raspberry Pi is pretty much all it takes. The Raspberry Pi actually has the huge advantage, at least Raspberry Pi version 2. I haven't tried version 3 or version, version 3 with it yet. Version 1 doesn't have it. The Raspberry Pi 2 at least has overcurrent protection on the USB interface. Very useful, especially if you try to connect a microcontroller to a computer using USB. If you don't want to use a Raspberry Pi, maybe because you want to use the Windows-based uh, development tools from the microcontroller manufacturers, it's pretty much standard uh, recommendation. Get yourself a quality externally powered USB hub and connect that to the computer and connect the uh, programmers or your own devices to that external USB hub. USB is a tremendously crappy standard. I mean, it's really unbelievable how they managed to screw up pretty much anything they could. Um, it doesn't require overcurrent protection on uh, a USB host. Basically means you have a fancy notebook, that's where it really hurts, connect something to the USB port that doesn't quite work and you might actually fry the USB port or even your entire mainboard doing so. Raspberry Pi has protection and even if it doesn't or if it doesn't work um, I'd rather throw away a you know 40 euro or what Raspberry Pi uh, board than uh, a notebook 
or big big computer mainboard. Um, so so much about computers. Oh, one more thing. You see, I've got a. Let me show you. Pretty small screen here. Um, it's about ten years old, and I'm glad to have it because these days you won't have anything as small as that. They charge you extra, and anything bigger on the bench is just taking up space. So I'm happy with that. Um, that said, I have a fairly big computer and a 4K display on my desk. So uh, if I do PCB design, 4K is luxury. I mean, this one's going to do the job, but 4K makes it much more comfortable, or at least full HD. Um, but when it comes to the microcontrollers as such, the Raspberry Pi is just perfectly good for the job. Next, uh, multimeters. Oh, this one. This, uh, German, German electricians call these lie detectors. These are supposed to detect where there is mains voltage, despite everybody telling you, no, we've, parted, we, we've switched it off, we've um, pulled the fuse or whatever. Um, these are really useful if you have to deal with mains voltage. And I got that because in a data center, it sometimes helps to figure out what's going on. If it's a broken power supply in a computer or if some something else happened, you don't need that on microcontrollers, which is good news. So uh, multimeters I've got and stuff for multimeters. Um, let's see. These are two of my multimeters, the two most expensive ones, <laughs> and they're not particularly expensive. Um, this one was 40 euros uh, on sale. I got this earlier this year when I was in the US for about, I think it was $35, US dollars, that is. And um, none of them were particularly exciting. Um, this is pretty much all you need. I mean, if the only thing you need these for most of the time is to check if some power rail is running on 3.3 volts or on 5 volts, you don't need an 8.5 digit resolution bench uh, multimeter. These are already overkill. And the reason why I bought this when I already had this was because this one is, well, smaller. Takes up less bench space. So I use these two. I've got three more. This one is kind of additional extra but I've been messing around with the uh, step-up converters and um, with those you really want to have four multimeters it can be cheapies 15 20 euros fine one thing make sure they have detachable leads otherwise they're probably gonna be a real crap this one again I think 35 US dollars is fine you don't need anything really exciting pretty much everybody Possibly with the exception of Dave Jones, he's talking about multimeters in this league. Um, pretty much everybody in electronics, they have this multimeter fetish. It has to be a Fluke um, um, 87.5 uh, or something like that for 200 euros. Don't bother. Something else you want, special measurement cables. Doesn't have to be any thick cable. Doesn't have to be security banana plugs because you're staying away from mains anyway. But having banana plug to crocod alligator clips, crocodile clips, whatever. And even more important, banana plug to just something you can stick right in your breadboard or female version is really just helpful. We talk about these connectors uh, later on. It's really all it takes. And um, by the time you need something better, you know what you need, and then you buy what you need. You can spend tremendous money on multimeters, and I haven't seen one that I'd say this has everything I'd consider important. And if they are, they're about this size, and bench space to me actually matters. Um, so don't spend money on that. One more thing, if you buy multimeters, buy different ones. It doesn't have to do with multimeters, but they all have their strengths and weaknesses, like pretty much all other stuff. And having different multimeters means you have the one where the micro current, uh, the microamp uh, range is using a 10 ohm 
shunt resistor rather than a 100 ohm shunt resistor so it's much less disruptive on your circuitry or you have one that can measure frequency up to 220 megahertz rather than 10 kilohertz like some exemp expensive one I've seen you can actually spend 200 euros on a multimeter that has a frequency range going up to 10 kilohertz that's not even covering the audio range but that stuff might be good for some other purposes just buy things as you need them and don't don't rush off buy whatever the most expensive is you can find right that's multimeters next thing power supplies now you see i have two bench power supplies and hardly ever use them Be why not because these days mostly play around with microcontrollers and for microcontrollers these are beyond overkill i mean these deliver up to 30 volts up to 5 amps means 150 watts output when all you can do even with the 80 mega 328p is 5 volts 200 milliamps which is one watt uh, <laughs> they're nice to have for some other stuff but there's no reason to spend you know i think the 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 core the the one on the right sent me back 80 euros and the the manson um 115 or so the left one is switch uh, switching regulator the other one is uh, linear um, no need to spend that much money what you can and should do and I've already showed you before unless I'm completely mistaken is something like this USB cable pulled out the two pins carrying wire put put connectors on there combine that either with a power bank which is in this case nice because it even has an on off switch or a USB wall ward. This one delivers 800 milliamps, which is fine. If that's not enough, big one does two amps, way more than you need. And this stuff gives you five volts and no worries. The one thing you shouldn't do is connect this straight to a computer again, because overcount protection is missing. You might damage your computer if you accidentally short these. Alternative to that, battery packs. Three are generally good if you use alkaline batteries for the PIC and Atmel AVR, two for the MSP430. If you use rechargeable ones that only deliver uh, 1.2 volts, you might want to go for uh, four cell pack and yes you need connectors for that we'll talk about how to connect these later on but these are just by quality stuff S spend the extra seven or eleven cents for one that actually lasts you a while um, works just just about perfectly that goes there if you think nah, but I need a precise voltage that's general, pretty much general electronics. There are all sorts of things. There's the venerable LM317. Pretty much everybody doing electronics have these. If you just need 5 volts, uh, 7805 might actually do the job. Um, the LM317, you can actually adjust the output voltage with uh, a pair of resistors. So they are pretty popular and they are sort of cheap. You just buy a bag of them uh, by the time you need them. If you use 5 volts as an input, an alternative might be some low dropout uh, regulators for 3.3 volts. These are some uh, TS2940 and TS2950. The small ones, TO92 package is good for 150 milliamps, probably fine for the job. Just add the necessary capacitors, put them in your breadboard or maybe on a bit of PCB, uh, perfboard strip board to build your own power supply and uh, you're pretty much set and if that's not good enough for you and you want to spend a couple of euros extra there are um, switching regulator modules available my Harrison of Mike's Electric stuff has done a nice video on these these aren't exactly cheap unless you understand what's actually in there and then you're surprised they can make them for this money um, the most interesting ones for a lot of purposes are made by a company called Pololu somewhere in Nevada I, 
I'm not sure if it's Carson City or, or uh, uh, Las Vegas or so. But anyway, they do these and um, look like this. They have, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 different models. Um, what's nice about these is they actually bother to, to label input output pins. What they don't do is label what exact type it is there. So you put a sticker on there. What's also nice, the connectors come separately, so you have to solder them on. It can be a problem if you don't want to do any soldering, but other than for other people, it basically means you can decide if you want to stand them upright or um, flat and which uh, side up. Um, these are nice. I've got this th this one here. I just got that uh, earlier this week. It's taking anything from 3 to 11 point something volts, delivers 5 volts. Um, so it's a buck boost converter, really nice. Make sure whatever you feed it, it'll deliver, deliver five volts. I've got a couple, this is an adjustable step up converter I used for the hardware random, random number generator. Um, these are a bit more expensive, they're about 15 euros, but nice for some experimenting. Alternative to that, there are a couple companies like Murata, Traco Power, uh, Recom, selling modules like this, which are more for industrial purposes and um, you see I've had to put a label on there what voltage did they deliver also an option that said for a lot of stuff just stick with the battery pack it's gonna last you forever and it's just gonna work everything else is just unnecessary money spent okay we're halfway through at least to my cheat sheet uh, next problem, how do we connect things to our breadboard? And um, you see the ICs and most components you just stick in, not not a big deal. Uh, when it comes to these wires, I generally use a combination of standard single-stranded tinned copper wire, like the yellow stuff here, for what I want to leave on the board for some extended time, and then these, I've got I've bought these pre-made, these jumper wires, uh, which I'm just going to rip out and uh, start over with the next experiment. But these jumper wires are actually, well, they're not exactly cheap. Uh, Packer 10 sets you back about 3 euros, at least with my preferred supplier. And um, so I got... I don't even remember why I bought these. These come in different lengths, can be quite useful, but mm, things sum up. And then you want, you don't know, these want male to female for whatever purposes, or female to female. I actually built these myself, not to save money, but because I needed them right away. And just used some, just ripped up some ribbon cable for that. And um, if you want to do that, you have a couple options. Again, Pololu, they are offering pre-crimped wires. So you just get the wire with the crimps inserts on there, but um, you actually buy the housings separately and then you stick your wires in. Might be enough, but eventually I reached the point where I decided I really need a crimp tool and the necessary crimp inserts to do these myself. Problem is the crimp tool, mm, first off there's some ultra cheap things that don't even have this ratcheting mechanism. Don't touch them for anything. They're really just asking for trouble. And uh, what's even more important for these crimp terminals you need uh, dies that actually match these. This thing sent me back about 30 euros, which is quite a bit of money. It's good quality, <laughs> admitted, and it has the right dies, but that's, well, it's a bit of an investment, at least for some people. When it comes to the inserts, I have three types. There's the standard female inserts that go into the housings and they are not exactly easy to get. Again, Pololu is the source for all this, or at least one source. 
Um, there are, and I just got these from uh, Pololo distributor the other day. These are male headers that actually fit into these housings. And I've been trying to find these for quite some time till I actually came across these on Pololo, from Pololo. Really nice. And then there's something, and uh, that's where I got the crimp tool from. Uh, some people in Berlin, a place called Zegor, they told me the best thing, if you want to build your own single wire sort of things, is actually, these are inserts, they're not for the housings, but they are for DE15 connectors. What's a DE15 connector? You know them as VGA connectors. You take these inserts, crimp them on your cable, put a bit of heat shrink on, and they're nicer because even with the heat shrink on, they're much thinner than a single pin housing. Very, very useful. Only downside is 30 euros. If you don't want to spend, want to spend those, I've already mentioned these Wago terminal, uh, uh, clamp terminals, which go straight in your breadboard. If you really need, you can actually use these, but they are not expectedly cheap either. They are almost a euro each. Buy, if you really want to buy a couple of these, you know, three pin, six pin, eight pin, ten pin, whatever. But in the long run, they're not going to save you money. That said, and I think I've said that before, if you take a look at these, you're surprised that they can actually be made that cheap because this is precision mechanics. No, you can't do this with your 3D printer. If that's too expensive, of course, there's always an option to go with a uh, terminal strip, run single wire, uh, single strand wire in on one end, multi-strand wire in on the other, and you're set. And if you think this is a bit unwieldy, go for the kitty version. Okay, so that's one way to connect things to your breadboard. And um, take a bit of a detour. Something you'll come across pretty often with microcontrollers are these IDC connectors, insulation displacement connectors. You've seen them on the uh, program I've got, for example. No, they don't go straight into breadboard, but they're so common, they actually really uh, worth a bit of a look. You get rainbow ribbon cable, different widths, gray ribbon cable. You can just tear them apart and crimp or, or, and uh, force these IDC connectors on. Trick is, or a couple tricks. First, make sure that the tab you have on here is actually on the right side. Basically means you look from the top, the tab is on the left, pin number one is on top. Second thing is, you can run the uh, ribbon cable in from either side, so uh, half the time you realize you have the cable running out this way when you want it to go out that way. You just get used to it. Um, third is, and I've only done this on one end, put a bit of uh, electric tape through what's called the strain relief um, to make it easier to pull out. Really, really helpful. Only tool you need to do these is a basic vise. You just take the the bottom part, the middle part, run the uh, ribbon cable through, put in a vise, keep turning, and when you hear a faint cracking noise, you take your side cutters, cut that thing off, start over because you broke it. Um, you just see when it's closing. It, it's okay. Vise just doesn't give you the exact feeling when, when, when you're done. Uh, then you pull the uh, uh, ribbon cable over it, put the uh, st uh, strain relief on. Don't forget the electric tape, like I do more often than that, and um, you're done. This is a dedicated tool for installing these. Cost me about eight euros, hardly ever use it. Uh, and I wouldn't buy it again. So, uh, yeah, that's ribbon cable and um, IDC connectors. And um, that still leaves the question open, how do we get this connected to our breadboard? Uh, you've seen me show you these adapters that I've built using a bit of stripboard and a bit of soldering. 
it's a more general problem. Something you need when you do when you work with breadboard and even with modular sort of PCB things, be it perfboard, stripboard, or some custom PCBs, is you need all sorts of adapters. And um, now these are the battery clips I've got. I've showed you the Wago connector. So uh, there's that, and I've actually have I've got three different setups. These are separate single male connectors, a pair of male connectors and a single housing. Nice to just put in the power rail on a breadboard. And this is a female connector I use for something else. You just want to have these around at some point. And uh, that's where the crimp tool eventually really becomes worth the money. I have tried to find alternatives to my homegrown adapters. Just check these. These are basically IC socket layout IDC connectors. Number of problems. First, they're expensive. Send you back about a euro each. They only come in a limited choice of pin counts. And what's probably worst, with a ribbon cable coming out right next to the breadboard, it's kind of annoying, frustrating to connect things there with a ribbon cable on the way all the time. So, um, yeah, probably find use for these sometime, but for now they go to the to the uh, junk box. Other connectors, USB to, in this case, 100 mil headers, could have been to breadboard as well. You just want to build these. And um, of course, the USB connector doesn't have its pins in a 100 mil grid like a breadboard, so you need a bit of, um, let's say, coercive drilling things in places where they shouldn't be, or using, uh, don't you need these very often, but sometimes they're really helpful, a couple small files to extend um, the holes in stripboard, perfboard to where I actually need them. Other adapter I just built when I got the uh, male headers from Pololu, Picky 2, now I have a proper connector, not this hot snot messy thing. And um, female connector, so I could just use it as an extension, plus an IDC connector uh, in there. Should pretty much do the trick for me for the time being. Other adapters you'll need. These are breakout boards with SMD. This is an SOIC chip. Looks scary first time you see it, but you can really solo that with pretty much a blowtorch. And I didn't believe that when I first tried either. It just works. So you need adapters all over the place. And um, there are two things you want to achieve with adapters first fit things into the 100 mil grid for breadboard and the other one is to just simplify connecting things. Remember the picket and running individual jumper wires from here to your breadboard. It's just no fun. Build these adapters. Any chance you get it'll make things so much easier and nicer. Beyond that you want to build modules. One of my early ones, 8 LEDs, 8 series resistors, and a 10-pin ribbon cable going to an IDC connector. And yes, there's the hot snot to keep this this nice and ugly and, uh, uh, well, alive. It lasted me for quite some time, thanks to the hot snot. Um, other modules. Yeah, this is going to get scary. Don't worry. Yes, you can solder these. It's really not rocket science. This is an SSOP28 FTDI chip. And the reason why I want to show you this is because I've actually put the capacitors you also need on these as well right on there. So I wouldn't have to worry about these anymore. Modules are useful. And they don't have to be big. I've already showed you this. LED series resistor two pin connector. And yes, these days, because I've finally got to buy these, I've got LEDs with a built-in resistor. And you just want to make sure you can identify them. So that's why I put a little ring of heat shrink around them. That's really, really useful. 
and um, things can go a bit bigger. Power supply again. This one has a barrel jack. I can feed it anything from 9 volts up and it'll just deliver 3.3 and 5 volts using two uh, LM317s plus bridge rectifier, polyfuse and uh, status LED and whatever. Build these. You're never going to be satisfied. You build one of these, it works and like 30 seconds later you decide, oh, I could have done something else. That's part of it. If you think, no, I want to think about it a bit more and then start doing you'll never get anything done. Just give it a try. Slightly more advanced. This is this is um, two max 232 uh, voltage adapters. On top you have four um, connectors for uh, UART 5 volt serial and on the bottom you have four connectors for RS-232. Build modules. It's really really helpful. And if you just want to practice a bit of soldering maybe you go something like this. Just a bunch of resistors with uh, adjacent uh, pin headers. Simple to solder very convenient sometimes if you just want to check with different resistor values. Don't need it that often, but for example, for figuring out what, if you have LEDs with different colors, what uh, series resistors to use so they have, all have pretty much the same brightness, really useful sometimes. And if you want to show off, take a look at this. Eight SMD LEDs eight uh, SMD resistors, nine pin connector, so I can have eight LEDs on breadboard as is. I wouldn't want to have to do these uh, under some sort of pressure. I really just did this to see if I could, uh, and they work. So, nice to have around. You really want modules to simplify your life. Breadboard is a huge mess once things get more complicated and modules give you a chance to do much more complex things still using breadboard. Okay, leaves uh, another topic, the one all of you dreaded, either because you already know and are eh, eh, once again, or because you're dead scared of it, soldering. Now. If you watch that video from Dave Jones, he says, okay, buy a decent soldering station and so on and on and on. And I guess he knows what he's talking about. But he's done another video, and I'll link that in on the forum as well. He took a 16 Australian dollars Chinese ultra low end electronic soldering station. And. Um, in a heroic uh, self-experiment, took a closer look at it, and in the end, conclusion was, I really don't like it, but yeah, it'll get the most basic things done, and if you can't afford anything else, by all means, go for it. Just don't expect me to use it. Now, if my, I mean, if you're spending half your waking hours with a soldering iron in hand, you wouldn't want to want to, you wouldn't want to want want to use one of these. But for the occasional, you know, building building a couple adapters and 100 mil spacing strip board, perf board, really isn't rocket science. You spent like 30 euros, maybe 40, for some basic soldering gear, soldering iron, solder, uh, solder wick, maybe something if you don't have any fan sitting around somewhere to get the fumes from away from your nose. Uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, I've got this, uh, it's a Xitronix, Taiwanese company, not one of the big brand names like, like Weller or Urza or so, but it's been doing its job for a couple of years now. Only problem, problem I see with it is I can't get any of the uh, more advanced uh, SMD well soldering tips or anything like that. But you get the regular set of uh, pencil uh, tip, which you don't really use anyway, and the chisel tips, perfectly fine. I do have a fume extractor and, uh, okay, 
the soldering pumps optional if you have solder wick if you have to choose between either one I'd go for the solder wick flux pen some tin copper wire for breadboard pretty much all it takes and then of course this question what do you solder and um, this is strip board yeah this is strip board strips of copper really convenient for things like those uh, adapters this is perf board individual pads sometimes both together are called perf board but this is um, the real perf board and if you are mucking around with multiple ICs never done that this is tri board three pads connected together apparently quite useful if you do discrete log logic but never really needed it just stocked up on it um, this stuff is really nice really convenient just make sure you shop around a bit and buy you know this 100 millimeters 500 millimeters one of these sets you back anything from four to six euros and uh, they last you for quite some time nothing really spectacular about it um, biggest trick is probably to when to decide for strip board when for perf board um, with these adapters well it's fairly simple because you connect the pins try for the the uh, pins for the, from the breadboard to the pins from the connector one thing you need to know how to get these um, traces cut in the middle uh, if you have a hole in between you just take a two or two and a half millimeter uh, drill bit and you break the board if you have adjacent uh, pins you need to connect to and you have to cut the traces in between I personally just use uh, hang on where you have them um, one of these um, cutter knives not a big deal okay one more thing and that's basically oh, for forget yes you can do custom PCBs and uh, when I was a high school student I've been etching PCBs myself when it comes to microcontrollers etching them yourselves um, aside from the fact that it's a huge mess and has been used huge mess and it will always be a huge mess but etching PCBs with traces as fine as you need for microcontrollers is pretty much hopeless um, there are a number of places where you can send your Gerber files which are the format you uh, s use for this um, from Eagle or KiCad or whatever send them there and they have them made for you and they can go down to trace with that you can hardly see with your bare eye um, you couldn't do that yourself at home so forget about that if you want to do custom PCBs order them from some manufacturer and no I'm not going to do a tutorial on that because there are so many other people who do um, no need for me to repeat all that one more thing documentation if you like I've already shown you how I put labels on these connectors this one is for the uh, MSP430 format and this is for the Atmel AVR ISP connector put labels on there I've even covered them with heat shrink trying to be good boy scout again um, really useful I have a number of little PCB modules that I have simply forgotten what they were good for probably didn't work anyway but I'm basically just throwing them away because reverse engineering what I've done there and then deciding no this really didn't work is just not worth it documenting things is really really helpful and the most important tools sticky labels and um, because they're frequently way too big for what you actually want to do technical scalpel or exacto knife Americans call them another brand name steel ruler to cut things to size fine tip marker and you're pretty much set you do that all over and it'll make life much much easier for the bigger stuff masking tape marker pen
you know, one of these permanent marker pens. And you're pretty much all set. And um, does it all work? Well, yes. Just want to show you something I've done uh, early this evening. I've got... Uh, this is a Recom, I think, um, step-down regulator. Delivers 3.3 volts from anything from 5 to 36 volts. So I really wanted to give it a try. Problem, of course, is this doesn't fit breadboard or anything. So I had to solder it on a bit of strip board, added a protective diode while I was at it, the connector and documentation. Just very, very important. One more thing. In case you think, yeah, but this looks, this handwritten stuff looks all messy, I'd rather use a label printer. Don't. Got these about two or three years ago from my one of my preferred uh, mail order places, Heichelt. They use these stickers. Sometimes they last, sometimes they fade within a year or so. It's just not worth it. And even if you find a label printer where you actually can rely on things to last for some time, um, they're just a pain in the ass. And sooner than you can think, you'll decide, oh, I can't be bothered to document that right now, to put a label on somewhere, and then you have some other stuff. Again, you're going to throw out sometime because you can't figure out what it is anymore. Put those labels on and... Uh, the, having these these um, sticky labels lying around all over your place, it's just not going to cost you any money. Oh, by the way, buy quality ones. Um, nothing worse than these things falling off like six weeks after you put them on. Okay, so um, there were a couple things I thought noteworthy on electronics when it comes to microcontrollers. Hope you found it useful. And um, once again... Buy things as you need them. Don't do this uh, call up DigiKey. I want one of everything. Are you sure, sir? Uh, well, okay, make it two. It's just going to ruin you. It's just going to spoil the fun, really. Um, just put the money where it makes a difference. And you've seen a couple of things that I frequently use. And uh, you should get pretty far with this or even a subset of these things okay so much about that for today hope you enjoyed it if you have questions suggestions um, or maybe know what the actual manufacturer of these uh, mail crimp inserts for the for the housings is because I haven't figured out who's actually manufacturing these come over to the forum at www.statladder.statladder-it.com slash bivblock slash 43 and um, next episode will be on microcontroller programming finally hopefully see you again soon bye <laughs>